Good evening, everybody. It's a, a real pleasure to welcome you to the uh, School of Forestry and Environmental Studies at Yale. Uh, my name is David Skelly. I'm the Associate Dean uh, for Research and Professor of Ecology here in the school. And um, I'll be uh, moderating uh, the forum this evening. Um, I want to thank, uh, first and foremost, um, our fellow sponsors of tonight's evening, uh, the Sierra Club. Uh, I would also like to thank the Yale Climate and Energy Institute. Um, and uh, you know, without, without their support, this wouldn't have been possible. I also want to thank uh, Senator Blumenthal and his, his staff for making this evening happen. Um, I want to start off by uh, introducing the organizer from the Sierra Club, uh, Ante Johnson, who's going to say a few words, and then I'll be back up to give the, the rules for the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. My name is Ante Johnson, and I'm the organizer for the Sierra Club. And tonight's discussion will be focused on climate change. For those of you that do not know, the Sierra Club is the world's largest and oldest environmental organization. We've dedicated the past 121 years for trying to protect the environment, raising awareness so that we can breathe clean air, and we can help combat against climate change. The past four years, the next four years in President Obama's election will be very pivotal on how we combat against climate change. We have seen devastating drought, floods, raging wildfires, and here in Connecticut, We've been impacted by hurricanes, Irene and Sandy. Just a couple of months ago, we had the huge snowstorm Nemo, and this is affecting our economy and it's affecting our families. So we are calling on our leaders to say, what can we do to help this issue? So we've put together this town hall, and we want to thank Senator Blumenthal because he's been a leader when he was an attorney general with the environment, and he can help President Obama with his climate legacy. We have Professor Nadine Unger, and we have Anthony Lizowitz, who is the director of the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication. So we hope that everybody would have a very uh, good time. We will have a chance to answer questions and ask questions to everyone here. And I hope that this will be a great opportunity for you guys to learn about the environment, because this is real. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ante. Um, and uh, I'm going to join Ante in, in thanking everyone, uh, all three of our um, panelists who are going to help us through the, this evening um, to talk about uh, a really important topic. Um, what we're going to do is um, ask each of um, our participants, starting with Senator Blumenthal, to speak for about five to seven minutes on the overall issue of, of climate change. Um, and uh, when each of them has uh, had a chance to speak, um, Senator Blumenthal, then uh, Professor Unger, and then uh, Professor Lazarowitz, um, then we're going to um, turn it over to questions from you that uh, came in in, in advance um, that we've uh, collated, and, and um, we'll use that as a basis for a conversation among all these three folks. Um, and then during um, the, uh, the presentation period, if you would like to write down uh, additional questions, there are folks with baskets spread, out, spread throughout the room that can kind of raise their hands uh, back there. There you go. Um, if you would like to uh, write down a question and, and pass it along, um, we're going to do our utmost to grab some questions from the floor that kind of kind of reflect what's what's going on in the room here. Um, the last opportunity to do that is going to be at the end of the the third um, presentation, uh, so that we have time to kind of collate those and and uh, neaten up handwriting and so on. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask uh, uh, the this, um, participants are going to speak from where they're sitting there. I'm going to ask each of them to spend uh, five to seven minutes. Um, uh, talking about uh, climate change and, and how they view it from their, their disparate perspectives. Senator Blumenthal. You want us to speak from here? Yeah, if you don't mind. Great. Well, first of all, let me add my thanks to the Sierra Club for having us here this evening. Thank you to Ante and to all the members who are here, all of the leaders, uh, but also for their 
championing the environment over many years during many fights uh, in Long Island Sound, in the hills of Litchfield, in the Farmington Valley. I can go fight by fight by fight, but you have been there, and I've been very proud to work with you and advocate with you for a cleaner environment for preserving what really makes Connecticut so special, what makes our planet so special, which is the natural resources that we want to leave for our children. And let me sort of begin where Ante left uh, his part of the discussion. We have seen over the last year to two years the indisputable effects of climate change in causing financial and human disasters. Here in Connecticut, we've seen uh, hurricanes, superstorms, snowfalls that are unmatched for their ferocity and their impact on our way of life as well as on people's livelihoods and lives. So there's a lesson here, which even the climate change deniers have trouble refuting, which is that our world is changing. And we have a window of opportunity to do something about it. It isn't, it isn't an opportunity that will last forever. And uh, somebody may not have liked what I was saying. <laughs> not for the first time. Uh, and, and I really don't necessarily need uh, this, because I think you all can hear me. Uh, we, have a, we have a window of opportunity, a practical window of opportunity to do something about it. I want to speak for a moment about the political window of opportunity, which is as real and important as the scientific or natural opportunity. And that window of opportunity is created by the presidency of Barack Obama, number one, the Democratic majority in the Senate, number two. And I think we need to seize this moment to try to push forward as quickly and forcefully as possible with measures that are achievable. There were some votes in the final hours of the Senate before it adjourned for the recess that were discouraging. There's no other way to put it. Uh, there was an amendment that essentially would have resulted in approval of Keystone Pipeline. It was approved by more than 60 votes in the Senate. It was offered by Senator Hoven. And there was a vote on an amendment uh, relating to an anti-carbon tax offered by Senator Whitehouse. It failed. Those were just symbolic votes. But they reflect that we have a battle ahead if we want to make progress on climate change. The good news is I think the American people get it. On a variety of issues, I've only been in the Senate for two years, uh, I've seen that a minority can stymie the will of what seems to be the majority of American people. We're seeing it at present on another uh, seemingly unrelated issue, gun violence. Uh, there have been a number of others uh, that, that I've seen while I've been in the Senate. But I think it is only a matter of organizing and galvanizing opinion. The majority of Americans feel that we can and must do something about climate change. And I'd be happy to take questions, but let me just finish with what I think is one of the major lessons that we need to impart. And it's sort of on this, on this mug. Business and the environment. Yale Center for Business and the Environment. One of the major messages that I tried to impart, well, I was Attorney General, I've tried to do it in this office as well, is that economic growth and jobs are not in conflict with environmental values. When we fought Broadwater, which was, as you'll recall, the natural gas facility that a number of major corporations wanted to put in the middle of Long Island Sound. In my view, the fight was not environmental preservation, Long Island Sound, versus natural gas, jobs, and business. It was, in fact, 
how do we protect a resource that provides billions of dollars in revenue through its use from recreation, navigation, and so forth against a force that would undermine that economic value. And similarly, the destruction of Long Island Sound would be an immense loss financially and economically for both Connecticut and New York. In every one of those environmental fights, I think the case could be made that we actually did better in terms of economic growth and business in the long run by preserving and enhancing the environment. Same is true on climate change. Ultimately, we will pay much, much more if we have to go through these continuing 100-year storms. You know, each of these storms is something that the insurance companies say happens only every 100 years. Well, the 100-year storm is now becoming the one-year storm, the new normal. And we are having to build new physical infrastructure. And we are losing shoreline. Literally, in the last year or two, as a result of the storms that we've seen already, which are just a harbinger of what is to come. So I think we need to make the case that economic growth and jobs are not only compatible with preventing climate change from continuing, but also are well served, in fact, enhanced by the effort to stop the kinds of causes of, carbon, of climate change that we know can be addressed. Carbon emissions, the whole, I mean, for this audience, I don't need to spell it out, but these, these measures are within our reach, they are feasible and doable, and we need to begin them. Thank you. So thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Now we'll hear from uh, Professor Nadine Unger. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal, ladies and gentlemen. The Industrial Revolution that began in the United Kingdom over 200 years ago and rapidly spread throughout the rest of the world is undoubtedly one of the most important events in the history of humanity. Our ability to unleash vast amounts of energy from fossil fuels has led to great social and economic benefits, but also to the two most dire environmental problems of our time, the global spread of air pollution and global climate change. So I want to make very clear up front here that Earth's climate system is dynamic. For example, 55 million years ago, the Earth system was so hot that crocodiles lived in the Arctic and Antarctica was a pine forest. If we go back even further in time, 650 million years ago, the Earth may have been a frozen snowball with ice sheets extending all the way down to the equator. We do know that over the past one million years, the Earth's climate system has been oscillating regularly between cool glacial and warmer interglacial periods about every 100,000 years. And um, in fact, in the last glacial period, about 20,000 years ago, there was a mile thick sheet of ice right above where we are all sitting now. So planet Earth experiences massive natural shifts in climate that are caused primarily by changes in Earth's orbit that are then amplified by feedbacks in greenhouse gases and the surface ice coverage that changes the color of the Earth's surface. So in this way, nature maintains itself a delicate balance of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. 
through a perfectly tuned, perfectly aligned system of biogeochemical cycles. In the time span of one human lifetime, in the great acceleration over the last half century, we have drastically altered these natural cycles. We have changed the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration, so it is now 30% higher than pre-industrial levels. Atmospheric methane concentrations are more than double pre-industrial levels. We have loaded the atmosphere with toxic aerosol particulates that um, have very complex impacts on climate, sulfates, organics, and black carbon, and also kill about one million people every year. We have also introduced into the Earth system entirely man-made halocarbon molecules, CFCs, HFCs, and HCFCs. These molecules do not occur in nature. Some of them have global warming potentials in the thousands, and others have ripped a hole in the stratospheric ozone layer. The industrial revolution goes hand in hand with the agricultural revolution, and we do know that the cropland expansion alone has modified 50% of Earth's ice-free land surface, half of the land surface. Never before have such changes in such a short time frame been experienced by planet Earth. So it is critical to recognize that the physics of climate change is not controversial in any way. The science is clear, it's well understood, it's well accepted, and it has been for the past 150 years. It is exactly like the unsinkable Titanic. If we smash a great big hole in the side of the Titanic, that unsinkable ship will sink. Similarly, if we continue to load the atmosphere with long wave absorbing greenhouse gases, the Earth's surface will warm. It really is that simple. What is more uncertain, and the cause of the scientific debate, are the feedbacks in the Earth system that can act to amplify or dampen the a climate response to the anthropogenic forcing. Even as we speak, the international scientific community is working very hard to understand better, uh, to improve our understanding of these feedbacks. Some relatively good news is that in 2010, the Cancun Accord did reach a consensus that global warming since the pre-industrial must be kept below two degrees C Celsius. And in the following year, in 2011, the United Nations Environment Program released an assessment report showing clearly and unequivocally that the only possible way to achieve this target is through immediate and simultaneous reductions in carbon dioxide and the short-lived climate warmers, methane, tropospheric ozone, and black carbon aerosol. So now that we're onto the subject of aerosol particulates, air pollution par particles, a formidable obstacle that we face is that the cooling short-lived climate forces, the cooling air pollutants, sulfate, and organic particles are currently masking 50% of the committed greenhouse gas warming due to the Industrial Revolution. That's huge. Half of the warming is being masked. James Hansen calls this masking effect humanity's Faustian climate bargain in that we have been enjoying the benefits of the Industrial Revolution without too much of a cost to climate yet. 
But payment is coming due because air pollution has now reached intolerable levels and must be reduced to protect ecosystems and human health. The implication is that air quality control legislation must be implemented with great care to avoid pushing the system past a tipping point and inducing a rapid warming surge that is unsafe for humans and ecosystems. The truth is that air quality control legislation is usually implemented without any consideration of the effects on climate. Here awaits a unique opportunity for this generation of environmental managers to develop win-win energy policy and mitigation strategies that are beneficial to both climate and air quality, and in so doing, maintain a safe operating space for humanity. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Nadine, for that chirpy synopsis. Um, now we're going to move on to Tony Lozerowitz. Great. Thank you, Dave. Um, and uh, first of all, let me say thank you to the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, uh, YCEI, and the Sierra Club for hosting this event. Um, it's really exciting to see this many people come out to have this conversation. And I really want to underscore that key theme, starting the conversation. Or another way of putting it is ending the silence. So uh, I thought I was going to take us back into history, and then I heard we went back 650 million years, so I don't feel so bad. Um, I want to take you back just a couple years, uh, to 2006, 2007, because I want to talk about the grand arc of what's been happening with public opinion. So that's what I study, is uh, large-scale public opinion on climate change. How do people respond to this issue? Why don't they respond to this issue? Uh, back in 2005, 6, and 7, we saw public opinion swelling up, surging up, and reaching what we could call a high water mark. Um, and what was unique about that is that this was in the context, and this is one of our oldest, most important findings all along, is that many Americans think of climate change as a distant problem. Distant in time, that the impacts won't be felt for a generation or more, and distant in space, that this is about polar bears, maybe some small island countries, developing countries, not the United States, not Connecticut, not New Haven, not my friends and family or the people and places that I care about. Okay? So it was one of those issues that was out there. Maybe we'll deal with it someday, but it wasn't seen as urgent or pressing. But public opinion started to swell uh, in 2005 and 2006 and seven. and what was interesting is that that was almost entirely a media-driven engagement for Americans. Let me take you back. That was the Bush era. This was the era of inconvenient truth the IPCC report, the Academy Awards, um, the Nobel Peace Prize for both Al Gore and the IPCC, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger passing climate change legislation in California despite the Bush administration. Okay? All of those were widely reported in the media, and that's how most Americans engage with this issue. Because guess what? Americans don't read the peer-reviewed literature. They don't read reports. They don't know climate scientists personally. Okay? They know about this through, predominantly, the media. But then a funny thing happened, and that was the year 2008. And among many things that began to happen uh, was the economic collapse, the financial crisis and surging unemployment. And we saw that public responses and engagement with climate change dropped pretty dramatically, uh, a 14 percentage point drop in Americans' even belief that climate change is happening, drops in that is human-caused drops in levels of worry and concern about the issue. And there were a lot of things going on there, not just the economic crisis. Another big one was that the media stopped reporting this issue. Newspaper coverage dropped by about two-thirds. Nightly network news coverage, like the CBS Evening News, NBC Nightly News, et cetera, dropped 90 percent. Okay? Now, this is an issue that all of us can look out these windows, if only we could, um, and there's CO2 pouring out of tailpipes. It's pouring out of buildings. It's pouring out of smokestacks. In fact, it's pouring out of each of us right this very second. 
and yet none of us can see it. It's invisible. Okay? And likewise, the impacts are invisible unless you know where to look. So when the media doesn't report this issue, it's literally out of sight and out of mind for most Americans. Okay? And so this bottomed out in 2010, okay? pretty substantial drop. Uh, and lots of other things happened in that time period as well. But since 2010, public opinion has started to pick back up again. Okay? And it has surged. It's not quite back up to where we were in 2007, but it's getting pretty close. And there's something, however, that's qualitatively different about this moment in the trajectory of this issue than where we were the last time we saw that wave beginning to crest. Again, back in 2005, 6, and 7, that was predominantly through media stories. Okay? And again, within the context that this was a distant problem. This time is different because as the senator alluded to just a few minutes ago, 2011 and 2012 were all-time record-setting extreme weather years. Okay? One extreme event after another, after another, after another. Okay? And what people have begun to do actively themselves, without waiting for scientists, without waiting for the media to tell them, are actively interpreting this emerging pattern. It's an old saying, if something happens once, it's happenstance. If it happens twice, eh, it's coincidence. If it happens three times, you're beginning to see a pattern. It happens four, five, six, seven, eight, 22 record-setting events times, $22 billion disaster times in the course of two years. Um, many Americans are beginning to connect those dots. And in fact, in our survey research, we show that eight out of 10 Americans say that they have personally experienced one or more of those natural disasters. A third say that they have either been personally or financially harmed by one of those events. And they are increasingly, now a large majority, upwards of 70%, believe that climate change is making many of these fires, floods, droughts, storms worse. Okay. So there's something fundamentally different in the way that Americans are engaging with this issue at this moment. Okay. And as I said, it is beginning to swell. It is beginning to surge again. So we are beginning to talk about it again. But let me just come back to that key underscored point. We have been largely silent, not talking about climate change for the past two years. Our political leaders have been silent. Many environmental groups have been kind of quiet. The media has been very quiet. Okay? And Americans themselves have not been talking about this issue. That has begun to change. Okay? And I think that's what's really interesting about this moment, because uh, the president himself called for this in his inaugural, as well as in his follow-up State of the Union address, is for Americans to start talking about this issue. Okay? And I think this gathering tonight is the beginning of what should be happening all over the country, conversations in communities all across this country about what does climate change mean to us. Not to the distant future, not just to polar bears and faraway places, but what does it mean to us in our communities for the people and the places that we love and cherish. Okay? This is the beginning of a new conversation. Thank you. So uh, thanks to all three of our participants for kicking this off so well. I want to um, just remind everyone, if you want to hand in a question, uh, now's your kind of last moment to do that. Um, I'm going to ask the first question of the panelists, and I'm going to sit down and join them, and we're going to get into uh, the conversation here. Um, and I, I want to build off something that uh, Tony Lazarowitz was, was just talking about. So these, these are all questions that um, came from uh, folks in, in the public. Um, what do you say to the sizable fraction of Americans who do not believe that the climate is changing or who do not believe there is human agency in those changes? And I guess what I would tag on to that is uh, something that Tony was saying, and that is um, when we have uh, these recent patterns of weather events that seem to support the idea of a changing climate, um, it seems like public response is, is there. But the same thing happens when we go for a long time between storms or, or between severe events. So. Uh, maybe Senator Blumenthal can kick us off on this. Well, I think uh, that that question is excellent, something I deal with literally every day at a lot of different levels, some with public officials, some with folks on the street. Uh, I don't think 
that the obstacle is so much whether there is such a thing as climate change. I think that Tony really hit the key point. It's a question of when it is a reality for us. In other words, people have a sense, yeah, things are changing, but they kind of feel, well, later this century. You know, it's something my grandchildren will have to worry about. A lot of people care about the world that their grandchildren will inherit, but it's not something that they get up in the morning and worry about while they're shaving or eating breakfast. And certainly not something they think about when they're out of work or when they're feeling they may be out of work. The country over these last few years has been seized with a real anxiety and apprehension about the future of the American economy. And rightly so, because we are really failing to train young people for the jobs that will be there in just a few years from now. There are openings now for people who do not, who can't fill those jobs because they don't have the right skills. Environmental science and this great school is training people for jobs that have to do with saving our planet and automation that will make manufacturing cleaner and technology that can help us do the kinds of things we need to do to avoid climate change. There are, again, I said it earlier, economic opportunities here that we have to seize. So in answer to your question, I would say to people, it's coming, you know it's coming, but it's sooner than you think. And just look around. I want to add one piece of good news here, and uh, I really should have mentioned it probably earlier. You know, uh, when we talk about what do the majority of Americans feel, I think we are dealing with a lot of different audiences. And Tony is also right that this conversation can be led by people in this room. You know, the country responds to individuals reaching out to them, leading by example, and look at how the world has changed in certain ways, you know, use of seat belts and so forth. But one of our main audiences is one person, the President of the United States. He has committed himself unequivocally in the State of the Union and in the inaugural to make this issue one of his priorities. And he has the legal authority to do it. The EPA has the authority to promulgate greenhouse gas emission rules. They may be challenged by industry eventually, they probably will be, but he can lead and his new EPA commissioner can lead by promulgating those rules and making sure that they are defended vigorously. So supporting the president is one of the things that audience that you can do and he, in turn, I think can also change minds. You know, never underestimate the power of the president to use that bully pulpit to change public opinion. And uh, also, you know, it just comes to me, one of, um, I'm sure I'm going to mangle this quote, but Margaret Mead's uh, famous uh, line about never underestimate uh, the ability of uh, a small number of intelligent, committed people to change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. So you can do it. So, so I'd like to address the, this issue about, you know, what do we say to that fraction of the American public who don't believe that climate change is happening or human caused? And I think it's actually a very serious question because the fact is, is that our politics are caught right now still in this first level of discussion. Is it even real? Is it human caused? Is it serious? Um, and first of all, I want to do something about saying let's stop, first of all, recognize it, or first recognize that the American public doesn't speak with a single voice on this issue. And in our own work, we've identified what we call global warming six Americas. Six different audiences within the United States that each respond to this issue in very different ways. And I won't go through them all. One at one end is the alarmed. These are people who think it's happening, human caused, it's an urgent problem, and they want to take action. 
but they don't know what that action is. And that's an important audience to communicate with. What are those solutions, both individually and collectively? But at the other end of the spectrum, we have two groups we call the doubtful and the dismissive. The doubtful who think, ah, it's not probably happening, but if it is, it's natural. Nothing we can do anything about. And then the dismissive who think, no, it's not happening, and it's not human caused, and many of them think it's a hoax. Okay? Now, first of all, it's important to recognize there are all those different views, but secondly, those two groups are relatively small. The doubtful in our last study as of just last September are 13%. The dismissive are 8%. 8%. And yet there are really vocal 8%. Okay? They're pretty organized 8%. There are an 8% that is well represented in the Senate. <laughs> Not this one. I, I know them well. But some of your colleagues. <laughs> um, so we can't ignore them. And so I wanted to say a couple things about um, these communities. First of all is to recognize that they are motivated by fear, just like many of the alarmed are motivated by fear. The alarmed are afraid of climate change. They're afraid of all these impacts that we've just been discussing, okay? But the dismissive are also afraid because what they're afraid of is the policy response. What they're afraid of is that to deal with climate change or that, that really climate change is an excuse to make the government bigger, to make it more intrusive, to increase taxes, to increase government regulation, to take away Americans' liberties. Okay? That's their fear, okay? at least for many of them. Okay? That's powerful, and we have to recognize that. It's not just ignorance. It's not willfully saying, I don't believe the science. Okay? There are reasons why they don't believe the science, and a lot of it has to do with their concerns that this issue is going to require fundamental changes in the relationship between government and society. In that sense, climate change is just another front in a much bigger war in this country over what is the proper role of government. Okay? Um, they also distrust the traditional messengers. Okay? They don't trust environmentalists. They certainly don't trust Al Gore. And they don't really trust Barack Obama. In fact, they really don't trust it, Barack Obama. Okay? So yes, the president can stand up and use his bully pulpit to engage with the majority of Americans, but by his very act of doing so, he's going to create a backlash among those who don't trust him. And we have to recognize that. So I'd just like to finish this point by saying, recognize as well that there are many different roads to Damascus. People can come to engage with the issue of climate change and the solutions to climate change from many different directions. Um, some people are going to engage with this issue based on their religious values. Other, because of the economic opportunities, and there are enormous economic opportunities in the clean energy future. Some are going to engage because of the national security threats. Others on the health impacts. Okay? And some may even start to engage around their core issue of freedom. Because if you're a rancher in Texas or a farmer in Oklahoma, it's not the government that's taking away your livelihood. It's not the government that's taking away your freedom of choice to live your life the way you want to. It's a drought, okay? And you can't appeal to anybody on that, okay? So in the end, that's one of the places I'd like to bring us back to is that, yes, this issue continues to be politically polarizing, but ultimately the climate system doesn't care. The climate system doesn't care whether you're a Democrat or Republican. Uh, check me if the models say anything different. Um, <laughs> doesn't care if you're a liberal or a conservative, okay? So Hurricane Sandy did not distinguish between Democratic households and Republican ones. The drought doesn't just take out liberal ranchers and not conservative ones. So we have to move that part of the discussion, is it real, is it human caused, is it serious, out of this politics, and then let's have a really robust political debate about what the best solutions are. So I want to, uh, do, do, you, do you want to say something, Nadine? Uh, yes, I would like to make it. one brief extended comment uh, on this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it will be brief. Um, on, on this uh, question, um, which is that, in fact, Americans who, who don't believe that climate change is happening in, in some way are quite smart. So if we, because if we 
I want us to move away from extreme events and think about global warming and issues of scale. So the global warming signal is 0.7 Kelvin. That's attributed to human activities unequivocally over the last century. And what humans experience, what we experience, is local weather fluctuations that are five to 10 times larger than that signal. So we can't detect global warming signal in our local experience, in our daily lives. The, the tragic problem, the very difficult problem, is that if we wait until the global warming signal becomes large enough for us to, to detect in our daily weather fluctuation experience, then we're on a completely different planet to the one in which civilization developed. We're in a world without a Himalayan glacier, without a Greenland ice sheet, with no chance of growing food in the breadbasket in the US. That's the challenge. So can I have a conversation about that? Um, sure. Because actually, I don't think it's quite that bleak. I mean, I agree with you. In the end, we have to have science to help us understand the real implications and consequences of what we're doing, no question. However, our own research that's been published shows that actually people do have the capability of detecting even the subtle changes in temperature and precipitation in their local experience. And then the other key thing is that it, you know, climate manifests through extreme events. And that is something that we absolutely do detect and, and can respond to. So I haven't given up on human beings' ability to, to respond to this issue yet. And it reminds me of the old saying, um, you know, it's the equivalent to the, uh, the boiling frog uh, analogy, right? That if you put a frog into a pot of water uh, that's boiling, it'll immediately jump out. If you put it into a pot of water that's room temperature and you slowly turn up the, the, the temperature, it will not notice the temperature change and it will croak. Um, <laughs> turns out, and Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, that's not actually true, that frogs are actually very exquisitely sensitively tuned to their environment. And when it gets too hot, they jump the hell out of the pot, okay? <laughs> and in fact, you know what this is too. You ever put your hand in a, under, a, under the kitchen sink and turn on the hot water and it gets hotter and hotter and eventually it gets too hot and you pull your hand out? That's the exact same thing that frogs can do too. So I think the question isn't, are we smarter than frogs? The question is, are we as smart as frogs? <laughs> And, and the, we, the, frog, the frog story, though, is too good to give up. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> so Tony just uh, betrayed himself because he just said that people don't read the peer-reviewed literature, and evidently he has read some of my work on thermal <laughs> preference behavior in larval amphibians. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's move on to uh, another topic as fascinating as the frogs are. Um, the natural gas boom and fracking uh, are rapidly changing the energy picture in the United States. Um, is this ultimately going to be a positive or a negative development for those worried about climate change? You want, you go want to go in order? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I, I really uh, want to lodge a formal complaint that I'm always the first to answer. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, but these, these responses are uh, so great. I um, feel I'm, I am learning. I hope you are from what my colleagues here are saying. Um, you know, uh, I think, number one, I think fracking obviously has grave perils. Safeguards are necessary, but the potential for more natural gas, I think, is a real opportunity. But what we really need in this country is an energy policy that incentivizes and drives renewables uh, of all kinds, solar, thermal, uh, you know, wind, uh, fuel cells, the state of Connecticut is the fuel cell capital of the country. We make fuel cells here in greater number than anywhere else. We could be the fuel cell capital of the world. Again, another way, environmental protection, smart energy policy can be an economic boon if we just had an energy policy that favored tax credits. You know, I, I spend time with the fuel cell producers of Connecticut and the United States, and other countries are encouraging manufacturing of fuel cells. 
we need to look beyond fracking to those sources of energy, renewable energy, clean energy, that can not only benefit us in terms of the environment going forward, but can offer even greater opportunities than new sources of natural gas, as good as they may be, because na natural gas is cleaner, but uh, other sources where we can lead the world and lead by example. That's what the United States can do, is lead by example. Uh, yes. Uh, so the in terms of natural gas and fracking, the latest climate science is clear on that uh, natural gas is not any better for climate than coal. It is better for air quality, but not uh, for global warming. Uh, a, a serious problem uh, with natural gas um, is leakage of methane. Um, and there is a serious lack of measurements of methane emissions and volatile organic carbon emissions from uh, fracking sites and uh, natural gas extraction sites in the US. In fact, this industry has grown so rapidly that these emissions are not even included in the US EPA national emissions inventory. They're not on the map. So, we certainly need to have um, a more extensive measurement campaign before we can um, say anything more, more uh, definitive about natural gas in the United States. Well, I'll just very quickly say, um, you know, I'm going to channel my colleague Jim Sayers. We had a whole panel on this, a fascinating panel on this last year, and you know he was very clear that the science is still very new about the ultimate consequences of this rush into fracking and into uh, natural gas. Yes, when you burn it in a power plant, it produces half the CO2 of coal, and that's important. Um, however, when you do a full life cycle analysis, from the well all the way through the pipes, through the distribution system, and into that plant, it's not clear yet. We actually just don't know. And yet we're rushing into this boom without having that scientific basis of knowledge. And that's, of course, of concern to those of us in the scientific community. Um, so we don't really know yet. And we don't know how solvable that is. You know, even if we do find that the wells leak or that the pipes leak and so on, are those fixable? Or is there something fundamentally wrong? Um, the other is, of course, this is a huge question of trade-offs. Um, coal is an old and dirty and polluting and terrible energy source for health reasons like she was just saying, all kinds of reasons. And yet, you know, natural gas does burn cleaner. It's better for health. It's maybe better for climate change, too. Okay? And it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm just saying, we don't fully know. Um, and there are these, all these other trade-offs. You know, the communities that have to uh, endure the fracking boom, it's an incredible uh, transformation of the local landscape, the local soundscape, the local smellscape, and everything else. Um, and I think the one other concern that I think many people would point to is that uh, this incredible new uh, energy source, which is American, okay, and it's not imported, um, however, it's been so cheap that it's making it harder for renewables to compete, that it's actually making it harder to put the fine, or to have the market incentives for solar and wind and geothermal and all the other things that we know are much cleaner. So I think we just have to recognize that this is one of those situations where, yes, people have very clear great, very clear bad, and then I think many, at least of us in the scientific community, are really uncertain. Maybe we can build on that, and, uh, and, and I'll, I'll start with Nadine this time. Um, so uh, Nadine, you've expressed some skepticism about uh, gas. So what, what does a realistic, climate-friendly um, energy portfolio look like? Um, can renewables do it alone? Should we be talking about nuclear? Step right in there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so there is um, a very provocative um, study 
uh, or initiative coming out of uh, Stanford uh, University led by Mark Jacobson that is a very clear, well-developed well plan to power the world's energy needs using wind, water, and solar, no nuclear. And it's very convincing, and uh, he, Mark has produced uh, several technical um, papers showing that uh, this, um, this way forward is, is feasible economically also. And this group's argument is uh, the main limitation is actually um, political will. So at this point, I'm going to pass it over to Senator Blumenthal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not cheering for that one. <laughs> no, uh, well said. Uh, you know, uh, let's, let's step back for a moment. The American economy is at a critical turning point. And even if you feel relatively secure about it, I can tell you that tens of millions of Americans do not. And I don't know what your polling shows, but you know, I've been talking a lot about gun violence, immigration reform, climate change. Overwhelmingly, the American people want to know that they will have jobs and that we will have economic growth. So you know, when you're talking about reaching audiences, which you have to do, if you're talking about convincing those six groups, think about beginning from some common ground. That we all have a stake in climate change, not just because it's the right thing to do or because there's a science that shows that we'll have more of these 100-year storms, at, but that we can create jobs by doing it and that we're not against jobs simply by favoring renewables or an, or an energy policy that compensates for, as was rightly pointed out, the cheapness, inexpensiveness of natural gas versus those renewables. To do what Nadine has described, and I don't know about this particular plan, but there are lots of them, you know, wind, water, solar, great. How do you make it work economically? And how do you make it work tomorrow? And how do you convince Americans that it won't deprive them of jobs? Uh, Senator Inhofe offered an amendment to block greenhouse gas rules promulgated by the EPA. The EPA, as you know, is promulgating, I referred to them earlier, these carbon emission standards for new coal-fired plants, new ones, not even dealing with existing ones. He offered an amendment to block it. It got 47 votes in the Senate, both Republican and Democrat. Now, that's not because people want climate change. It's because of the apprehension that it will be detrimental economically. And I think that's what we really need to address in any of these plans that maximize the importance of renewables, and they are realistic. I'm, you know, nothing I've said should be understood or misunderstood to say, oh, well, they're pie in the sky, they're unachievable, but to move them forward, we need to deal with Americans where they live, which is getting up in the morning and going to work, having a job, feeling sure they can put their kids through school, that they will be secure in their retirements. These are real life, and, and I know many of you in this room already know this. I, I apologize for telling you something you already know, but I can't emphasize too strongly the importance of the economy and jobs. Yeah. So maybe and I hate to, you know, I don't mean to be the, the pessimist or the naysayer here, but I think it's something we need to deal with in that conversation that Tony says very rightly we need to have. Well, let's push in on, on that a little bit. Um, I'm going to combine uh, a question that came in before the event with one that, that came from the audience here. The um, uh, question before the event was uh, basically asking, what's the role of market-based mechanisms to make this happen? And a question from the floor is, 
do, do basically, do we need cap and trade or a carbon tax to make it happen? So what is going to be the way forward um, to get Americans on board something like this? Uh, well, I'll, I'll actually combine my answer a little bit with the previous one. Um, and I, actually, it goes back to a wonderful quote from Bill McKibben. Um, and it actually is recognizing the scale of the problem that we have. Okay? It's not just the scale of the climate change problem. It's that this is about our energy system. As Nadine quite rightly pointed out, an energy system that has given us all of this. It's in our clothes. It's in the food we eat. It's in the way we get around, in the buildings we're in, everything. It's fossil fuels. Um, and Bill McKibben's wonderful quote is that we need to resist the temptation to look for silver bullets. What we need is silver buckshot. Okay? We know, we're going to need a lot of different approaches. There is no one thing that's going to solve this. Solar can't do this by itself. Wind cannot do this by itself. Nuclear cannot do this by itself. Okay? And in fact, there are a whole range of things that we need to do, which also include forestry and conservation, uh, as a matter of fact. But also, and I'd just like to put my emphasis here, on energy efficiency and conservation as one of those key things. And in fact, it's one of those key things that you can get both Democrats and Republicans to agree about. Those dismissives I talked about before, the people who, don't think, who think climate change is a hoax, they conserve energy as much as anybody else in America. Okay? Not because they care about climate change, but because they don't like wasting things, first of all. Okay? And secondly, they certainly don't like wasting money. And the fact is, is that this country is not the world's leader when it comes to energy efficiency. We're way down the list of other developed countries. Okay? We are throwing money literally out the window every day. Okay? And that's not good for our economy. That's not good for our jobs. That's not good for the environment. So there's actually a big slice of this problem that we could solve with an aggressive effort to improve our energy efficiency in our homes, through insulation, through more fuel-efficient vehicles, through lighting, through air conditioning, water heating, et cetera. I mean, this building itself is a testament to the effort to try to become more energy efficient. Um, I think there's actually tremendous economic opportunity, in no small part for retrofits with our existing stock here in New England, which, I mean, talk about an inefficient uh, infrastructure. Um, I'm living in a house that was built in 1912, and I can tell you, it is not efficient. Um, There's so much we can do, but the great thing about those retrofits is that those jobs cannot be outsourced. Okay? Those are going to require Americans coming into every building in America and making it energy efficient. You cannot send that job to the Chinese. Okay? So that's at least one of the places where I th would hope that the two parties could actually come together and say, look, we have shared American values here of waste not, want not. Um, to the other question about market mechanisms, well, this comes to the question of comprehensive climate action. And um, I, I personally don't see that happening because, yes, we have President Obama in the White House who wants to take action. Yes, we have a majority in the Senate uh, who perhaps want to take action. Um, we also have a House of Representatives that is run by the other party, which right now, uh, many of them dispute that climate change is a serious problem. So. I don't yet see how we get that comprehensive uh, solution out of Washington, D.C., which by no means means that we have to just stop and wait, because there's a tremendous amount of good things that can be done at the state level and at the city level and so on, uh, incredible amount of good stuff. But in the end, it seems to me those market-based mechanisms are one of the ways, hopefully, we can bring Republicans back to the table. Because I think perhaps, and this was something President Obama said in his State of the Union address, he, re he hailed John McCain and the efforts to pass a market-based cap-and-trade system, first sponsored again and again by John McCain, former presidential candidate for the Republican Party, and said, but if you won't use a market-based mechanism, you're going to force me to use the EPA and to regulate. Okay? So that is hopefully the reaching out and the stick. Because okay, everybody recognizes that EPA regulation is not the most economically efficient way to solve this issue. So perhaps politically, uh, the other, uh, the, those doubtful and dismissive of this issue 
will come back to this and say, look, we want to solve this problem, but we want to do it with our free market principles, which one of which was cap and trade. Carbon tax might be <coughs> another. Cap and dividend is yet another form of that, uh, that basic approach. But will the politics support it? So <clears throat> I have one more question I want to make sure we get in um, before I invite uh, Ante back up to the podium. Um, I think uh, a couple of you touched on the fact that um, climate change can feel like this distant thing, and it can also feel uh, very disempowering to um, people to, to figure out what they can do. And so what I wanted to finish up doing is combining, again, a, a question that um, was uh, uh, sent in to us ahead of time with one that came from, from the floor. Um, the question from beforehand was, what can we do here in Connecticut that can make a difference uh, for a global issue like climate change, as, as Nadine emphasized? Um, and, and add on to that, uh, there was a question from the floor about the Bridgeport uh, Harbor uh, power station. Uh, should we close it? Is that one of the things that we can do? So who wants to step in? Mm -hmm. So what, what can we do here? Well, what we can do as a, as a community here in Connecticut, I would support driving less. Don't drive unnecessarily. Don't use our cars unnecessarily for long trips. Don't drive with one person only in a car. Use public transport wherever possible. I was involved in a scientific study that showed clearly that on-road transportation is the most warming sector on short timescales and is unambiguously warming on short and long timescales. So anything we can do to reduce road vehicle emissions as a community is doing something for global climate change. Well, I'll go second and let the senator have the last word. Um, so I think there's a number of things that we could do here in Connecticut. I mean, certainly at the institutional or governmental level, um, and I think the senator already alluded to them, we are one of the world's leaders in the clean energy economy. Uh, we should invest in that. We should invest in that big time. Um, we should invest in clean energy. Okay? Uh, Connecticut already pays some of the highest electricity prices in the world. Okay? Uh, we all, and I will speak personally here, uh, I want solar panels on my roof because I have been 10 days without power after Hurricane Irene. And then came Superstorm Sandy. And then came S Snowstorm Nemo. I'm starting to feel like climate change has something personal for me because <laughs> I live in Hamden, Connecticut, and we got 40 inches of snow. Um, I think we could r strengthen Reggie, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, of which Connecticut was a pioneering leading member our own regional cap and trade system. Um, I don't know enough about this, but Connecticut is one of the world's capitals of the insurance industry. What are we doing here in Connecticut to engage the insurance industry, who have a lot at stake, a lot at stake? Um, but the last thing I want to just end with is something actually for all of us, um, those of us who don't get to just strengthen Reggie um, ourselves. And that is organize. We just need to get organized. Okay? We need a powerful social movement that's demanding political change, that strengthens the spine of our elected officials, that challenges those that uh, are standing in the way of progress, and that transforms this whole country. And I think every single one of us can be part of that. Thank you. Uh, I, I didn't go last to have the last word, uh, so I'm happy to yield back to either uh, Nadine or Tony. Uh, you know, I think market-based discipline has a real role to play. I wouldn't call it a carbon tax. If you call it a carbon tax, you are not putting it in the most favorable light. I would put it as the polluter pays. The costs of pollution have to be factored into the costs of products. Because right now, 
and forgive me, I've forgotten from my economics 101 what the economic efficiency term is. Maybe you can tell yeah. me, or there must be an economist in the room, but essentially. Yeah, internalize the externality. Exactly. That guy comes through. <laughs> <laughs> it just shows I, I need to go back to school. Uh, so the, the market has to more accurately reflect the pollution costs of products. Uh, number two, uh, you know, again, I, I keep coming back to this point because I live with it every day, but there are enormous opportunities, exciting opportunities. We tend to see climate change as a great big looming threat, but it's also an opportunity. You know, retrofitting those buildings has become a new industry in many cities. The Empire State Building, top to bottom, has been retrofitted. And Bill Clinton talks about this issue every day, literally, well, not every day. But he talks very powerfully and eloquently about it, that this movement to retrofit our buildings can be a source of immense job creation. Uh, number three, and I'll finish on this point, uh, and I said it at the beginning, you know, a majority of Americans really get it. That's my sense, that they're concerned about it. The question is how immediate they see the threat as being and whether economically they see it as an advantage. The more we can talk about it positively, the more we can make those majority of Americans, that majority, be on our side. And we do need to organize. When I say we, I mean the folks who are concerned about climate change need to organize because that majority has been a silent majority. As with anything else in, or a lot of other things in politics, a vocal minority can, can block action. And we need to make sure that that majority is less silent. And this kind of conversation, as Tony said at the very beginning, is so important as the kind of step that needs to be taken all around America. Maybe not in academic settings, all of them, but in the town councils, in the state legislatures, in the mayoral offices, it needs to come from the bottom up. It's not gonna happen uh, in the Senate. Uh, this, this discussion has been, uh, in terms of erudition, way beyond the normal conversation in Washington, D.C., I can tell you. Uh, and it no, doesn't need to be this erudite or scientifically informed, just as long as it can convey the basic facts so that grass, at the grassroots level, America begins to feel it's important and that they, yes, that they vote, that they vote and that they make this issue a priority. Thank you. So uh, thanks again to our participants. I want to invite Ante Johnson up, and, and then I'll have a, a brief announcement right after that. Wow. Let's give everybody a round of applause one more time. Thank you. That was a wonderful, wonderful discussion. I hope you all were very informed, educated more, uh, it was great to hear it from a political standpoint. It was funny to hear about the frogs. <laughs> but I just want to thank Yale University a School of Fortree and Environmental Studies for putting this event on, uh, co-sponsoring this event with us. And I just want to recognize just the unsung heroes. Uh, we would not be able to have this event a success without first you guys being here, so give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> I would like to thank, I would like to thank uh, Bethany Zimba, the Assistant Dean. I'd like to thank the Sierra Club, uh, Connecticut chapter that's here, and our folks that came and traveled all the way far. Robert Gardner came down from DC's with Greenpeace. Uh, thank you guys very much. Um, the last question uh, we were asking was asked, uh, what should we do uh, in Connecticut? And 
what should happen with the Bridgeport coal plant. And just to give you guys a little bit of knowledge of what's happening is Connecticut actually has an opportunity uh, to make history uh, and become a coal-free state. And we know uh, from the discussions that we have that natural gas is cheaper and it's cleaner uh, than coal, but coal is devastating uh, and it has horrible impacts. So Connecticut does uh, have an opportunity to become coal-free. Uh, just the other day I seen that Los Angeles a mayor announced that they are going coal-free, and this is happening all across the nation. States are starting to become coal-free. So Connecticut has a huge opportunity uh, to continue being a leader. So I wanna thank everyone here today for this discussion. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal, for your time and coming and talking about this. We uh, encourage you to continue being a leader in, in D.C. Uh, but this is what we wanted to do, is to bring this focus and awareness to President Obama. He's been talking about climate change in his inaugural speech in the State of the Union Address. Uh, on February 17th, 50,000 Americans rallied in D.C. and they were saying that we need to do something about this. <laughs> Regardless of the science, we know that it's real. Uh, in Bridgeport, I live in Bridgeport, we got 30 inches of snow when Nemo came and uh, we couldn't leave out of our houses a week later. So, you know, this stuff is real and we really need to do something about it. And now is the time to do something about it. And we will have a reception uh, afterwards. So I encourage everybody to stick around to network and get the chance to know each other. Please stop by our table and sign our petition. Uh, you know, stay involved, stay engaged on our website and our mailing list so that you guys can know what's coming up. <laughs> We have a lot of things coming up with the Sierra Club, and we hope that you guys can stay engaged. If you guys have to leave, we hope that you would drive home safe, stay warm, and uh, thank you, and have a good night. Great. Thank you. So uh, let me add my thanks to uh, everyone who made this happen tonight, and especially for all of you to coming out. Um, there are going to be um, refreshments, and I think dessert sort of things that are going to be um, out in, in the Knobloch Center there. Uh, so feel free to, to hang around a little bit. And uh, thank you again.